Welcome to Living on the Edge. My name is Chip Ingram and I'm your host. And it's good to be with you. As we begin a brand new series, I'd like to ask you a very important question. Are you thirsty for more? In your relationship with Christ, in your spiritual journey, are you tired of kind of rules and religion and self-help spirituality? If you're thirsty for more, if you want to meet God in a fresh way, a powerful way, and really experience Him, you're going to want to stay with us. I start with a very personal story today you're not going to want to miss. Stay tuned. Listen very carefully, because many of us who've been a Christian for many years don't believe this. God has a dream for your life. All dreams don't get fulfilled. All Christians don't get to experience near what God wants for them. But God has a dream for your life. And we're going to spend our time together discovering how you can really experience that. I'll tell you a story. It's one of the most personal ever uh, where I realized how deep that connection is between a father and a child. Because when we say God has a dream for your life, you, oh yeah, theologically that's true, and I know the Bible talks about that now, and God wants to do something, but we lose the emotion. I want to tell you a story to get you connected to how the heart of God feels about you in this room tonight. It was our firstborn. We're at a banquet. Teresa is pregnant, like really, really, really pregnant. And she turns to me in the banquet and says, it is time. And so we go to the hospital. Uh, it's a 27-hour labor. Uh, within the first few hours, there's complications. They put a monitor on my little boy. And uh, for different reasons, they can't take him right away. Uh, there's medical complications. And so I'm sitting next to my wife uh, for about 24 hours straight because this happened after about three hours. And there's this monitor. And as we're sitting there, it goes... Beep, 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 because a little baby's heart is very, very fast. And then she would have a contraction, and it would go beep, 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 get the doctor, get the nurse, beep, 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 beep. And we went through that for 24 hours straight. And I think we stopped and said, Lord, you know, we understand this little boy is yours. And children are a gift from the Lord, and we want to offer them back to you. I think we did that about three times, about every eight hours. And I realized as I heard that heartbeat, and he was on the edge of he's not going to live, he's not going to, oh, I guess he's going to live, he's not going to live, is I, I had all kind of dreams in my heart for my boy. I had pictures like I did throwing a ball with my boy. I had dreams of, you know, what he could be and what he could do and how maybe, maybe he'll get to know Christ at an early age and what we'll do together. And he's going to grow up someday and he'll be an adult. We'll be friends. We'll hang out. We'll have fun. It'll be great. And then he might die. And I want you to know that every single parent has a dream for your child. Every parent has a dream. And sometimes in the early times, it's sort of superficial. It's a dream. Should they be a doctor, a lawyer, a stay-at-home mom, a, an athlete, a musician? Uh, you know, maybe, maybe he'll take over the construction company from me. Or, you know, maybe he'll learn some of those trades like I have or be a missionary. And you think vocation. And then the more you're a parent, you realize, you know what? I don't care what they do. I mean, down deep, right? I, I don't care what they do. Your dream more and more is about what kind of person, right, your little boy or your little girl or your grandchild becomes. And what begins to the burden on your heart is, will they love God? Will they love people? Will they be selfless? Will they be a person of integrity? Will they be a person that lives in such a way where they will grow up and you'll have connection and authenticity and reality? And that's the dream of your heart for your kids, and you have little bumps here, and maybe you kind of wanted them to do that. Instead, they changed their major 17 times and, and make it through that four-year program in six <laughs> with a lot of extra money. But you know what? If they're the kind of person, it's awesome, isn't it? Now, I will tell you, kids have this amazing ability to bring great joy to your life, don't they? The birth, the birthdays, the graduations the milestones, the spiritual growth. But I will tell you this, your kids have the power and your grandkids have the power to bring the deepest pain you'll ever experience on this planet. We could take a microphone, I could pass it around this room and you could talk to me about one of your kids going south or one of them in an addiction or one of them in a hospital 
or one of them in a situation that's in a relationship that breaks your heart or a decision that they have made that has alienated you from them where you don't have relationship right now or it's hostile and there's conflict. Every parent has a dream for their child and kids have the ability to be a source of great joy to moms and dads or almost immeasurable pain. And here's what I want you to hear. Where do you think you got that? Where do you think, as a parent, you got this DNA inside of you to have a dream for your kid? See, you have a father. And your heavenly father's name is God. And he has a dream for you. And for reasons that I do not understand nor can give you the theological basis for, because he is self-existent and needs nothing, he has chosen willfully to allow your life and your behavior and how you respond to him to either bring joy or sadness to his heart. Now think, look up in the sky sometime and look at all those galaxies and all those stars. The creator of all that there is has chosen you, and you can bring joy or you can grieve him, right? He's not the force. He's a person. And so God has a dream for you. And you can be a source of unbelievable joy and delight. Zephaniah says he will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. But the Bible also talks about his heart is grieved and the stiff-necked people and how they've turned away from me. And I know there's no, like, you know, tears in heaven, but I will tell you, if tears were allowed in heaven and God would look right now in the 21st century on his church all around the world, and I spent the last five years, I'm in, in so many countries, it makes my head spin. And I've seen the church in countries all around the world. I will tell you this, our heavenly father would have tears coming down his face when he sees the state of his church. Because God's dream is the kind of person you become. God's dream for his children is that every one of you will long to be with him. He wants you to be a little Christ one. He wants you to be a mirror of him. He wants you to be a man or woman of integrity. He wants you to have a longing for him and a care for others. He wants you to be Christ-like. He wants you to be holy. He wants you to be loving. He wants you to be tender. He wants you to be the kind of person that reflects a lot his son. That's his dream. And all the researchers say, and our young people are screaming at us, the Christianity they're growing up with in the 21st century says this, but lives like that, and it doesn't add up. And we're not fulfilling God's dream. About 9 out of 10 Christians in America, according to Barna and Gallup research, their words and their works don't tell the same story. They're not like Christ in how they spend their money, use their time, treat one another, forgive one another. They're not like Christ in the way that they tell the truth or don't tell the truth or stay in relationships or keep their commitments. They're not like Christ in what they put into their mind and what comes out of their mouth. We are bringing God great pain in his heart and it grieves him because he loves us so much. The dream I had as that little heartbeat was going beep, beep, Beep for my son. Oh, I wanted him to have it because I love him. And God has a dream for your life that is great and good and wonderful. And it grows out of his kindness and his love and his goodness and his forgiveness and his concern for you. And he wants to develop everything about you. But at the heart of what he wants to develop is your character. He wants to make you like his son. That's the big agenda. More than where you work, more than, you know, specifics of how this out or that turns out that's the heart John Stott has spent about the last 15 summers if I followed the article in Christianity last year uh, carefully uh, every summer traveling around the world he's uh, a Christian statesman all souls church there in England and he said there's no denying in the last 40 to 50 years evangelism and church planning and the work and the hand of God around the world has been like never, ever in history. Millions and millions of people are coming to Christ. He said, but upon personal, careful investigation for 15 years, visiting the church all around the world, he said the equivalent of the greatest need in the church is spiritual maturity. He said, we are 16 million miles wide and about a 16th of an inch.
And you know, as our young people see that, you know what they say? I don't want that consumer Christianity. I don't want that cultural Christianity. I, I don't want that inauthentic Christianity. I don't want your rules. I don't want your religion. Guess what? God doesn't want the rules and religion either. He wants to make us like his son. It's his dream for you. His dream is that in the body of Christ, beginning with your life and my life as ordinary, regular people. Are you ready for this? That Christians would actually live like Christians. I mean, it's a novel thought today, I know. But that Christians would actually live like Christians. And part of it is, is how do you, what is an authentic follower? What is a disciple? Jesus said, make disciples, but what do they look like? And how do you measure it? And, and what is it really? Because what happens when you talk spiritual maturity, you get with some people and they start taking, well, I guess spiritual maturity is you're religious. So you go on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, uh, Bible study, serve here, serve here, serve here. Does anybody know anyone that's like really religious, goes to church a whole lot, and has a really bad temper, and is a real jerk, and you don't like to be around them? I do. So I guess religious activity is not a good way to measure spiritual maturity. Or other groups... You know, because we, we want to get there. Well, I'll tell you what, spiritual maturity is the rules. And this group says, keep these seven rules. Don't do those five things. This other group says, seven. No, we got 12 things you can't do. Rules, 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 rules. And people live by guilt. Rules lead to legalism. And, and the letter kills and the spirit gives life. And so you ask the question, What's the profile? I remember I was in, I had an aha moment. I was in Nigeria, and uh, we had about 8,000 pastors that we were training about how to grow a high-impact church. And as we were talking to them, we, were, we said, you know, the first law of growing a high-impact church is you've you got to get clear on the purpose. It's to make disciples. What is a disciple? And there's a guy with a laptop over here and a guy barefooted over here. And, I mean, you know, it's this whole different shrinking world that we see. And, and so, you know, I tried a couple times. If you've ever spoken in front of a group and realized whatever you're saying is not getting through, that's where I was at. And, um, and I had one of those just moments from God. It happens, and looking back, I realize he's been sort of working on this about 20 years. And I told those pastors, guys, time out right now. Let's forget the seminar. I mean, we're pastors talking about making disciples, and we can't even agree on a definition of what a disciple is. What is an authentic follower? If you, if you don't know what it is and you can't measure it, how are we supposed to produce it? I mean, our part. And they all said, yeah. I said, you know what? Right now, this was one of my Holy Spirit moments. I said, if there was a big server in heaven and you, were, you know, got on your computer because the guy had a laptop, right in. Ready? Heaven.com slash disciple. It goes up to heaven. Do you know what would come down on your computer right now? And they all went. <laughs> and I was thinking, I hope I got something really good to say right now. <laughs> Seriously. And, and I, heard, I heard come out of my mouth, you know what it would say? Becoming a Romans 12 Christian. I said, guys, stop right now. Open your Bibles. Go ahead. Open your Bibles. Okay? I want to give you the executive summary, the Reader's Digest version, the profile, the picture of what an authentic follower of Jesus Christ looks like. Not born out of religious activity, not born out of roots. It's born out of 11 chapters of God's grace. Eleven chapters of sin is the problem, salvation through Christ, the Spirit's work and sanctification through a sovereign God. That's chapters 1 through 3, 4 and 5, 6 through 8, and 9 through 11 of, chapter of, of Romans. And in chapter 12, he opens up looking back at God's grace. It's completely relational. It's completely grace-oriented. It's absolutely not performance-driven. And he's now going to give you a profile that's relational about what his dream for your life is. What his dream for my life is. And he's going to go through five categories of relationships. And if you can find any other relationship on the planet that's not in Romans 12, see me afterwards. I can't find another one. Now, this is not all there is to being a follower, authentic disciple of Jesus Christ. But this is a great thumbnail executive summary. And in verse 1, what he's going to say is your relationship first with God. This isn't how you become a Christian. You come to Christ in chapters 4 and 5, right? Salvation by grace through faith. Christ died on the cross. He paid for your sin. He's our substitute. You receive that with the empty hands of faith. The Spirit of God comes into your life. You're taken out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, reckon yourself dead to righteousness. There's a battle in chapter 7. The Spirit of God produces the life of Christ, chapter 8, in you and through you. And he says, well, then how do you relate to God? 
I urge you, look at your Bibles. I urge you, therefore, my brothers, in view of God's great mercy, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to him, which is your spiritual service of worship. Now, if you have room, you can write this in your Bible or on the back of your notes. All I want to give you is five little things. It's an overview of the profile of disciple. Your relationship with God is surrendered to God. And put verse 1. Surrendered to God. God's dream for your life begins after you've come to know him personally, where you're surrendered to him. And we'll talk about what that means. Look now at verse 2. It's about a relationship with this world system, really this world's values. And the prince and the power of this world is the enemy, right? And so he says, do not be conformed any longer to this world or the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that your life or lifestyle could actually prove or demonstrate what God's will looks like. That it's good, acceptable, and perfect. So verse 1 is your relationship to God. Surrender to God. Verse 2 is your relationship to this world's values. And it's separate from this world's values. That's the simple outline. In verse 3, he's now going to move from God and your relationship with him in the profile to your relationship to this world system or its values. And he's going to say, you need to have a relationship with yourself. Look at verse 3. According to the grace given to me, I say to every man among you, do not think more highly of yourself as you ought to think, but think as to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. We'll develop this later, but a root word there that has the idea of thinking soberly, accurately, clearly about yourself happens four times in that one verse. God wants you to have a sober self-assessment. He wants you to look in the mirror and look at yourself both the exterior and the interior, and say, God has made me like this for his glory. I have these strengths. I have these weaknesses. There's where I fit in the body, verses 4 and 5. These are the gifts he's given me. And so the profile of a follower who's authentically walking with God, who's becoming Christ-like, is surrender to God, separate from this world's values, sober in self-assessment. And then look at verse 9. He moves from God to the world, to yourself, to your relationship with other believers. Look at verse 9. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Giving preference to one another in honor. Not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Then talks about practicing hospitality. There's about eight, nine, or ten staccato participles that all act as commands that says this is how we treat each other in the body. You don't go to some service and sit in the middle and nod and then get in the car and evaluate the guys talking or whoever spoke and the music. And, and then you live your life over here and you have this little compartment that says the God compartment. We went to church. That's not authentic followers of Jesus. It's, are you ready? 9 through 13, relationship with the believers, serving in love. You are involved in authentic community where the real you is showing up and meeting real needs for the right reason in the right way. And God's supernaturally using you to love people and bring about dynamic transformation in them and in you. And then finally, in this world we live in, there's not just God. There's not just the world system energized by the enemy. There's not just a relationship with ourself. And it's not certainly, you know, with just believers. We live in a hostile environment time with unbelievers. So what do you do when you get injustice, when you get ripped off? What do you do in a fallen world when you're treated wrong? Look at verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and curse not. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. It's speaking about how you respond to unbelievers. If your enemy's hungry, what do you do? Feed him. If he's thirsty, what do you do? Give him a drink. And we'll learn what it means in so doing you'll heap burning coals upon his head. By the way, I'll let you know right now, that is not God slams him for you, okay? And look at verse 21, the very end. Don't be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. We're salt, we're light, we're power when Jesus is living his life through us. Verse 14 to 21 is our relationship with unbelievers. Supernaturally responding to evil with good. Supernaturally responding to evil with good. There's the Reader's Digest version of God's dream for your life. In his relationship with you, what he's looking for is a completely surrendered heart so he can do in and through you and give you the best beyond what you ever dream. In relationship to the world, he's looking for you to be separate from this world's values. 
He wants you to have a sober self-assessment, an accurate view of you. No false humility, not too high, not too low. He wants you serving dynamically an authentic community with deep, loving, great relationships. And then he wants you to supernaturally respond to evil with good. I want to invite you on a journey with me to wipe away some of the tears from the face of our Savior, who I think, as he's seated, seated at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us, can't help but look at his church, his bride, and be grieved in his spirit that we have such little family resemblance. Millions upon millions upon millions of people all over this globe claim the name of Jesus, say they're born again, say they believe in the Bible, say they really are sold out, say they really love God, and their lives tell an almost completely different story with little or no family resemblance. I can take you to countries in Africa where 80% of the population claims to be born again and 85% are HIV positive. You do the math. And I can take you to places all around the world that we can just start right here, right? With you and me and America. And there is a bar of followership. There's a bar of discipleship. There's a dream. But God says, here's the profile. And as you become that kind of person by my power and by my grace, what I have for you is beyond your wildest dreams. G.K. Chesterton made a great comment at one time. He said, Christianity has not been tested and failed. He said, genuine Christianity is rarely tested. And what we're talking about is the real thing. Not religion, not rules, not intellectual faith. We're talking about God's dream for you and how you discover it and how you experience it. And we're going to go on a journey together in the next several sessions where you're going to get to taste that and see that. And here's what I want to tell you. Would you be willing to open your heart? Some of it's going to be challenging. So much of what has been pawned off as legitimate New Testament Christianity is so far from Scripture we have been subtly pulled and soaked in in ways where when you begin to see what the bar is, you'll realize, oh my gosh, my lands. I, I have American Christianity or I have cultural Christianity, but I'm not experiencing God's dream for my life. That's my challenge. Father, I pray right now it will take a work of the Spirit of God in supernatural ways For us to be willing to not just hear your voice and not intellectually nod, but to open our lives and our hearts and our views and our paradigms of life and ourselves and say, God Almighty, as you hear our spiritual heartbeat go from beep, 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 to those slow beep, beep, God Almighty, would you please help us to be willing to say, Lord, teach me, renew me. I want to fulfill your dream for my life. He that spared not his own son, how will he not with him freely give us all things? Lord, I just can't help but believe we're missing so much of the grace and the love and the joy and the power and what you have for us. And many, because we don't even know what your dream for us is. Teach us. And Lord, we surrender now. If you will show us what to do, we will follow. We will struggle, but we will follow, and we'll help each other in Christ's name. Amen. Got the overview? Kind of got it? That's a little bit different, isn't it? Isn't that neat in one little chapter that bang, 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 bang? As we begin this journey together, and here it is, to discover and experience God's dream for our lives, I want to just kind of have a little confession. One, I didn't grow up as a Christian. Two, I never opened the Bible till I was 18. Three, I had a very negative church experience growing up. As soon as I could get out of there, I did. And four, uh, by the time I was 17 or 18 years old, I wondered whether God really existed. But after a, a successful high school career in academics and athletics and earning a basketball scholarship and had a pretty girl on my arm, uh, my success formula did not equal happiness and fulfillment as advertised. 
I grew up in an era and with a great dad who just said, Chip, get up earlier than other people, set clear goals, develop a strategy, work really hard, and you can be successful. And therefore, you'll, so you get good grades. And do, do, do. Well, guess what? I got successful. And I was empty, and I was disillusioned, and I wondered what my purpose was. And I started asking those big questions that we all ought to ask. Why am I here? What is my purpose? What's life all about? And I look back, and granted, it was a small little pond, so those things I was successful in, it's not like I was king of the world, but I was smart enough to know that you could just make a bigger pond and be successful in that and be just as empty. And I actually didn't make progress by getting all the right answers. I made progress, and this is what I'll challenge to you. I started asking some of the right questions. And the breakthrough question for me was this. I still remember looking out my bedroom window, lots of stars. If God exists, I don't know if you do or not, but if you exist, what do you want from me? You ever think about that? I mean, if there's someone that created these galaxies and these stars, and we've got this, you know, one little tiny galaxy of ours with, what, a couple billion stars and estimated there's a couple hundred billion galaxies, if there is a God and he made all that and he's personal and he loves me and anything in the Bible is remotely true, if that could be true, what's he want from you? What's he want from me? That was the question that started me down a path to discover God's dream for my life. And I think that's one we want to look at together. Well, I want to thank you for beginning this journey with us. You know, as we ended today's program, that was the fundamental question, isn't it? What is it that God really wants from me? Have you ever asked that question? I mean, down deep in your heart, you only have so many years. What is it that God really wants from me? Let me invite you to stay tuned every week at this time, and we're going to go on a journey together. You're going to discover God's dream for your life, His purpose, your passion, and how it all fits together. See you next week.